Georgia Kelly. She's the founder and executive director of Praxis Peace Institute, as she said, and she's produced several multi-day conferences in Europe and California. Some of you um, obviously have attended them, and they're always rich and deep opportunities for learning. Georgia creates educational programming for Praxis, as well as leading workshops in conflict resolution. She is the editor and co-author of Uncivil Liberties, Deconstructing Libertarianism, a critique of libertarian ideas and laissez-faire capitalism, which she's going to be talking to you about. And as she said, her book is out in the lobby. She writes a blog on Huffington Post and enjoyed a previous career as a harpist, composer, and recording artist. And I've heard her music and heard her play, and she's really quite extraordinary. And it's something that over the years George and I have enjoyed is that we actually both come out of an artist background and ended up um, getting very active in environmental and economic issues. And so we've talked about, you know, how do artists really move into these different territories and what we bring creatively to the conversation, we hope. I've known Georgia for almost a decade now, and she's always working to get at issues of systemic change and push forward at a cutting edge agenda. Let's give her a warm welcome, Georgia Kelly. Uh, and it's always nice to hear Osprey speak because I always feel I'm, a, I'm the most radical person in the room and then I hear Osprey and feel, okay, I'm not the only one. There are other radicals in this room, probably everybody. Um, so some of the things that she mentioned, Naomi Klein's book, and I ha I'm reading it right now when I have time. And one of the things she says at the beginning is our economic system and our planetary system are at war. And I think that goes perfectly with what we both said earlier, is that um, the climate crisis is not going to be solved with the economic system we have. So we're really going to look at that very deeply over the next few days. So our first question with the conference is, how does our economic system determine the way in which the climate crisis is being addressed and will be addressed? What is the underlying default mode that always seems to self-correct and return us to things like fossil fuels, fracking, or nuclear power just when we start making progress towards sustainable alternatives? Why does that always happen? We must understand this systemic <clears throat> excuse me, dynamic in order to correct it. In the 1970s, we thought everything was about to change in terms of the, in the environment for the better. Jerry Brown was governor for the first time, and he was an environmentalist. He put up the windmills we see all through California and gave tax credits for people who put solar panels on their roofs. This was a whole new thing. But following his eight years in office, we had 16 years of Republican governors. And all, most of that was undone. Not all of it, we still have windmills, but a lot of that legislation was undone. And then Reagan was elected to the White House and tore down the solar panels from the roof. And this was a harbinger of things to come. Uh, President Carter had been in a line with environmental sustainability and all of a sudden this was undone. And I think removing those solar panels was a, uh, a very dramatic gesture to say we're not buying into this environmentalism and that's exactly what they haven't done. So in some ways we've gone, we went one step forward and it seemed like two steps backward. And today, we're finally getting momentum again. And as Osprey mentioned, the 400,000 people in the streets demonstrating, this is powerful. And yet, we have to be wary and not take anything for granted because we've been here before. Um, and things can be undone. And what we have to do, they can be undone by being ignored, by what the media, how the media treats it, can even be undone by stolen elections. And all these things have to be addressed when they happen. We, I believe we have a historic moment right now where the progressive story can finally become the most powerful and compelling story around. We must make the most of this opportunity without rose-colored glasses. So what would an economic system that supports environmental sustainability look like? First, there must be a compelling story, and David Corton will certainly talk about that at the conference. Um, the disasters that can be attributed to the climate crisis have set the stage for our story, or the openness to a story, a new story. Next, part of the story must include the commons and community 
rising above the Wild West notion of the individual uber alles. Uh, Gordon Gecko, John Galt, Jay Gatsby must be discarded as role models by our culture. Um, and seen for the shallow, wounded, fictional monstrosities that they actually are, instead of heroes. The late psychologist Herbert Marcuse said, quote, Western civilization has always glorified the hero. And I think this might be one of our problems. The hero, the celebrity, the superhero, some of this has to be put away as the, as the culture matures and be more connected to community. Leaders don't have to be heroes, managers don't have to be heroes, and we can have a type of hierarchy that honors knowledge <clears throat> but doesn't become a domineering type of hierarchy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the Economic Sustainability Conference is both an accounting of what is, which is our default mode, and an exploration of what is possible, which will be our vision. First, we must acknowledge the problems inherent in our economic system, which are perpetuating the dependence on fossil fuels, avoiding serious investment in renewable energy, turning a blind eye to social and economic injustices, and continuing to put our dollars into military expenditures. The time has come for radical systemic change in our economic, cultural, and political spheres. So let's consider some of the ma major stumbling blocks to systemic change that we will have to address and are addressing in somewhat already. Maybe the first is the media. The media does not present the climate crisis in a realistic light. Instead, often they ask people on opposing sides, do you believe or not believe in the climate crisis, to enact a mock debate about climate change, as if there were equal numbers for and against, believe or don't believe. Um, comedian John Oliver did a really good piece on this. I don't know if anyone saw it, but um, he noted that if you were watching this kind of debate on television, oh, thank you, um, would look at this and say, oh, there's an equal number for and against, an equal number who believe in there's a climate crisis and an equal number that doesn't, or they have a, one scientist pitted against one person who doesn't think there's any such thing as a climate crisis. And it looks like a 50-50 split, or at least it brings the, brings the question into doubt. Is there really enough science to prove there's a climate crisis? So for John Oliver's mock debate, he brought out three climate scientists, I mean three deniers, I'm sorry, three climate deniers, and then he brought out 97 uh, climate scientists. He said, this represents the real picture here. We have 97% of the climate scientists saying there's a climate crisis. And we have 3%, and he called, he referred to the 3% as some dude being pitted against a scientist. And this is taken as real. So one of the problems here, and, and John Oliver said it really well at the end of the skit, and I think it should be our mantra. You don't need people's opinions about a fact. And I, I, you know, this is so obvious, and yet the media would act like it's not obvious at all. So you don't need people's opinions about a fact. He said, you might as well take a poll asking which number is bigger, five or 15? Or do owls really exist? Uh, or is the earth flat? And the, the answer will be told by which number of people support whatever that is. So it's, it's not really up for questioning, and yet these things are put up as if they are not decided or there is not consensus from the scientists in the climate arena. So it's unfortunate that most of our good news is coming from comedians rather than news programs. But it is the truth. John Stewart, Stephen Colbert, John Oliver um, do present news often in context with snippets from C-SPAN so they can build up a, a story or a case. So we have work to do in holding the media accountable and for uh, continuing which they do, to equate opinions with facts. Because when there's a controversial issue, that's the mainstream media's default mode. Facts and opinions are equal. So I think this is a one demand we need to make of the media, that opinions should not be given the same credibility as facts, which is not the case today. That scientists should not be pitted against some dude, an uninformed, ideologically driven person who is often benefiting from corporate interests. 
Though it's critical in some ways that we have our own media, which we do, we also need to penetrate the mainstream media because most of America does not watch the alternative media, unfortunately. Hopefully we can move more of them to it. Another big block that's connected to the media, need some water, is advertising and the limited discourse that's allowed in the media. $500 billion is spent annually in the U.S. on advertising. $500 billion, so you know they wouldn't be spending this money if it wasn't working. Um, the masters of influence determine many of our decisions, whether it is through obvious sales pitches, political maneuvering, or through product placement in films and television. We are bombarded every day by features of, quote, the good life, which we are somewhat manipulated into wanting. The BBC documentary Century of Self, have any of you seen this? Oh, some have. I would highly recommend it. It's four hours, but it gives the history of advertising in the U.S. And there's a, a piece about Edward Barnes, who is the nephew of Sigmund Freud, and he took psychology to a different place than Freud. Um, he started working with corporations, candidates, and how to manipulate people into going for things that they wouldn't even think they wanted at all. And one of his very clever um, projects, before I mention that, uh, Andrew Carnegie once said, capitalism, the idea of capitalism is to turn luxuries into necessities. And that's what advertising does. So one of the things Edward Bernays did, um, well, I don't know which tobacco company it was, but they wanted, they realized they were losing half of the population that they could be selling cigarettes to, women. In the early part of the 20th century, it was considered improper for women to smoke. So one of the tobacco companies got a hold of Edward Bernays and he said, how can we get women to smoke? This is a huge market. So he came up with the idea of getting that season's debutantes up in front of the Easter parade on Fifth Avenue, all smoking. Overnight, this changed the culture. Women then started smoking. Just something that simple, people copy the lifestyle they see, they emulate the lifestyle, they don't even know that they're being manipulated. But it's, a, to me, a striking example of how um, effective this kind of advertising is, especially what I would call lifestyle advertising, where you see a certain type of lifestyle in a movie or in a TV serial, and, oh, that looks cool, I want to do that. That's a very it's kind of insidious but very effective way of getting um, a, a message across. And I think there's a, another book that I would recommend. It was written in the 70s, but it's very well connected to this. It's a little pessimistic, um, called The Culture of Narcissism by, uh, Narcissism by Christopher Lash. And he gets into the, indi the advertising industry and how it has manipulated people. In fact, one thing he said about this type of thing that happened in New York is that women were being manipulated in a way to see themselves as emancipated from patriarchal authority only to, to be subjected to corporate patriarchy. <laughs> so it's, you know, the same thing in different clothing. So this is kind of what we're up against in, in the media and the advertising world that will, sh that will shape and um, message the story the way they want or the way their corporate sponsors want. So part of this is, again, looking now at the um, acceptable limits of the debate or the words that are allowed in the culture, the words that are not allowed. And I think what we're needing to do is somehow create a cultural intervention that cuts through all these things that have us captive as a culture. The limited discourse is something I think we're all very aware of. And often liberals are so afraid of being called a socialist or a communist or a radical that they cower from it instead of standing up to the person and saying, what do you mean by that? Define that word for me and let me define it for you as I see it. Really take it on. Don't cower, move up to it. I've always thought it's fascinating how Bernie Sanders, who's a avowed socialist, calls himself a democratic socialist, is never called a socialist by the right. No one ever calls him a socialist. And I think this is fascinating because if, he, if someone said, you're a socialist, he would say, yes, I am, and this is why. And that's the last thing they want him to do. They don't want him to use it as a place of educating other people about another form of economic um, organization. 
So no one ever gives him a hard time about being a socialist, and he'll admit it openly all the time. So I think if we're more upfront with whatever our views are, uh, and not be coward or be put off or get defensive about it, I think we'll be much more powerful in getting a message across. Another place where the limited discourse, and all of you have experienced or seen this, are the presidential debates with two major parties creating and determining the questions of the debates that will be asked, leaving only enough time for soundbite answers. The League of Women Voters, I don't know how many of you know this, used to produce the presidential debates. But in, on October 2nd, 1988, the League of Women Voters' 14 trustees voted unanimously to pull out of the debates. And on October 3rd of 88, they issued a press release and this is what it said. It's radical. The League of Women Voters is withdrawing sponsorship of the presidential debates because the demands of the two campaign organizations would perpetrate a fraud on the American voter. It has become clear to us that the candidates' organization's aim is to add debates to their list of campaign trail charades, devoid of substance, devoid of spontaneity, devoid of answers to tough questions. The League has no intention of becoming an accessory to the hoodwinking of the American public. How many of you knew this, that the League of Women Voters, okay, a few. Maybe it would be good to get the League of Women Voters doing the presidential debates again and, and formulating the questions and not letting the parties have anything to do with it. So these are just, you know, some things we might do that would, would have a difference. I want to be watching my time too. Um, so one of the steps to take in changing the system is exposing the media and its complicity with a narrow band of acceptable discourse that serves the corporate agenda and laissez-faire capitalism. Uh, we both, Osprey and I, have mentioned our book on Civil, Li on Civil Liberties, Deconstructing Libertarianism. We will be doing a workshop on this book, or, or not a workshop, but a roundtable sort of on Wednesday over the lunch break. I think it's at 2. So it's just for an hour, so you can still get to the regular workshops. All the authors of the book, there were six of us, it was a cooperative venture, will all be there. So I hope you can come to that too. Um, we all know that economic interests in a capitalist system demonstrate that endless growth is necessary in order for this system to continue. And this is where the rubber hits the road. And this is why we're taking on capitalism, because we don't see, or I certainly don't see, and the people working on this conference don't see any way that this could work in this system. So we're having to relook at what would the system look like that would support economic sustainability, social justice, economic democracy. Well, one of the people, some of the people that I have invited here to the conference come from the Mondragon Cooperatives in Spain. Not only are these worker-owned businesses, but the worker-owned businesses, and we were discussing this at dinner last night, have an ethic. They have their own culture, and it's different than ours. It's mo much more community-oriented, community-caring. It's not the self over everything. Um, and it's a very calm uh, culture, I, I think, compared to ours. It's not frantic like, like ours has become. So the culture is different. And in order for the economic system to be different, the culture has to change. And that's where a lot of the speakers here at this conference will speak to the cultural problem of of getting this to, to a different place from where it is today. Um, our, our culture really supports the short attention span, the quarterly report. Uh, everything has to be speeded up, and what we're going to need to do is start slowing things down, unplugging somewhat. I know when I, uh, I lived in Big Sur for many years, and during that time I was really unplugged. I was practicing my harp and doing music and um, kind of barely getting by, but very unplugged, didn't go to movies, didn't, go to, didn't watch television, and didn't know what was going on in the culture. And what that ultimately did for me, and I didn't know it then, was that I always would be out of the culture <clears throat> to some degree. Because those eight years forged a different way of looking at culture and a different way of being kind of in it and not in it. So I think we all need to unplug some of the time, whether it's a retreat, a vision quest, or just going on a vacation without your iPhones and without your iPads, and really unplug, because the unplugging is what opens up the possibility for vision, what opens up the creative thinking. And as Osprey mentioned, she and I are both artists, 
uh, uh, that was our first calling anyway. And there's something about the creative process that's really conducive to systemic change. And that is, you know, when you're up against a writer's block and you think, oh, I can't get there, you don't push yourself to get through the block. You go take a walk. You go do something else. And when you come back, these little synapses have somehow worked them their way out and you've got the idea. Einstein said that his best ideas came to him when he was practicing the violin. It's that kind of breaking from the total focus to just letting it go and letting other things come in while you're thinking about something else. And I think that's part of the way we need to address the cultural change is that we have to start unplugging from it, at least periodically. Not all the time, not forever, but periodically so that we always have perspective of what's going on. So that's, I think, some of the solutions. We're going to be presenting a lot of them here during the, during the conference. And um, the transition is going to be one of the big things I think we need to talk about. How do we go from where we are to where we want to be? Um, how do we convert this kind of cultural mindset to one that's more cooperative and um, more in, in tune with the oneness of all beings? So some of the presenters will be I, all of the presenters actually will be taking on different facets of the solutions and discussing them. I don't think anyone's going to come at you with, here's the answer. That's not what we're here for. We're here for exploration, for sharing of ideas, and by the end of the three days to have some sense of, okay, what can I do? What can I do with this group? What organizations do I want to work with? What groups can work together? So it's looking at how we're going to support each other in these changes. One of our speakers at the end of the conference will talk about how we could convert the entire planet to renewable energies in, I think, 16 years or, or more, but somewhere between 16 and, and 30. But what's missing is the political will, the cultural knowledge and education, but not the technology. So we're, we're up against that. And I think we're, we're understanding that and we're ready to um, embrace some of these ideas. Another possibility would be things like job sharing, guaranteed income. We're maybe getting to that point where there'll never be full employment because they're being automated out of existence, a lot of the jobs. So what would that mean? Job sharing with full, with full salary? Cooperatives? There are lots of economic models that we can learn from. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Public banking is something that could also help that. Uh, that kind of process. So what we're going to be looking at over the next few days are, the sol are some solutions and hopefully we'll have very vibrant discussions and we don't want everyone to agree with everybody. I mean that wouldn't be any fun. So I hope you all have a really uh, exciting time here and uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing from all of you. I'll, I know during the break we will have um, half hour so you have time to really mingle, talk with each other and we try to build in enough breaks and enough time for people to meet each other, talk and uh, enjoy in your company and learn. So thank you for listening to me uh, and I will introduce our next speaker.